TEDx UC Davis asks us, what do we work toward? I work toward exploring the final frontier, and I want to know if there are little green bugs on Mars. <laughs> Although we've never seen these little green bugs, we're still intrigued with the mysteries of the red planet. So in the 1800s, the astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli looked through his telescope and thought he saw channels crisscrossing the surface of Mars. He named these channels canali, and a mistranslation of that term led people to believe that there were canals, irrigation canals, that were crisscrossing the surface of Mars. They believed that these canals must have been built by an intelligent Martian civilization. It was at this point that the concept of Martians began to embed itself in popular culture and inspired an entire genre of science fiction literature. One of the notable novels of the era, and one of my personal favorites, is H.G. Wells's The War of the Worlds. The War of the Worlds is a classic piece of invasion literature, detailing the story of a man escaping from the Martian invasion. Although this story has been adapted many times into different media, one notable adaptation to radio in 1938 left listeners in an outright panic, thinking that the broadcast was the real-time report of a Martian invasion in New Jersey. <laughs> Even today, our interest in Martians persists. When the 1975 Viking orbiters sent back images of the surface of Mars, the infamous face on Mars became an instant source of speculation to extraterrestrial intelligence enthusiasts who claimed that the face was evidence for a long-lost Martian civilization. So, I ask you, where are these Martians? <laughs> if there were big and obvious life on Mars, we would have met it by now. Since we haven't met Marvin the Martian, we need to modify what we expect life to look like beyond Earth. If there is or ever was life on Earth, or sorry, there is life on Earth, I hope. <laughs> if there is or ever was life on Mars, we would expect it to be tiny, microbial life, like bacteria. This bacterium is a cyanobacterium, and it is a million times larger than its real-life counterpart. That's the scale at which we would be looking for life, a million times smaller. If we want to look for life on Mars, we need to start with what we know about life on Earth. Microbial life on Earth requires three things to live. Water, carbon, and a source of energy. And it's the search for these three that has greatly influenced our exploration of Mars. In 1971, long before I was born, the first satellite to orbit Mars sent back pictures of a cratered and desolate terrain devoid of Shia Pirelli's Canali. But this little bit of information, these images, spurred curiosity in us, and in 1975, we sent the Viking life detection missions to Mars. The Viking landers sent back the first color images of the surface of Mars from the surface of Mars. These were revolutionary images in planetary exploration. But the Viking landers had a different primary mission. Their mission was to perform three life detection experiments. The experiments were conducted, and the results were ambiguous at best. The Viking life detection missions left us with no real evidence for life on Mars. But it taught us that we needed to reassess how we were looking for life on other planets. And this is how I explore Mars today, not by looking for life, but by trying to understand the chemistry and geology of Martian rocks. In the 37 years since Viking arrived on Mars, we have rapidly increased our presence on the red planet with a fleet of satellites, landers, and rovers. The first rover on Mars was Sojourner. Sojourner was a little RC car-sized robot, and she was sent as part of the Mars Pathfinder mission. Sojourner was built to push our technology toward the final frontier and prove that we could land a rover on Mars and operate it. But she was also built 
because scientists were passionate about understanding the chemistry of Martian rocks. We learned an incredible amount from Sojourner, and the two rovers that came after her were revolutionary machines. The twin Mars exploration rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, were built to follow the water and look for evidence of water on Mars. Now, to me, one of the most incredible things that we have discovered about Mars in the past half century is that not only did Mars have a lot of liquid water in its past, but there is water on Mars right now, today. There's ice in the ground. We've delivered landers to the poles and dug the ice out of the ground and analyzed it. And there are features all over the surface of Mars that look like ephemeral streams that flow only in the Martian springtime. Now that we know there was a lot of liquid water on Mars in her past, we want to explore a hospitable environment where bacteria would want to live. The Mars Curiosity rover is the newest and biggest Mars rover built to explore a habitable environment in Gale Crater on Mars. I joined this mission because I want to know if there's life elsewhere in the universe. And Mars is a great place to start looking. Characterizing a hospitable environment on Mars is the next step in addressing our questions about the presence of life in the universe. In our first seven months on Mars with Curiosity, we've already discovered our first hospitable environment. I'd like you to take a good look at this image. This is another revolutionary image in planetary exploration. These are the first drill holes made by humans on Mars. Now, I shouldn't say that they're made directly by humans, of course, because Curiosity had to drill them. And asking a robot to drill holes for the first time on another planet is actually kind of challenging. So for starters, Curiosity doesn't speak English, so we have to communicate with her through computer code. We wrote thousands of lines of computer code asking Curiosity to drill these holes and to take pictures of them and to analyze the chemistry of the rocks around us. And the data she sent back told us that this environment was once wet. There was a lot of liquid water here, so much so that it formed a river and lake system. She also told us that the water that used to be here was neither too acidic, nor too alkaline, nor too salty. You could drink this water. She also told us that the elements necessary for life, including carbon, are present here, and that the state of the minerals could provide energy to certain kinds of bacteria. So, in our first seven months on Mars with Curiosity, we've discovered the three things that microbial life on Earth requires to survive. Water, carbon, and that source of energy. But, there's no obvious life in this rock, is there? We don't need to dig up fossils to find evidence for life on Mars. Life can leave behind chemicals and shapes in the rock where it lived. And even if the life is gone now, that can provide evidence that it was once there. If there is other life in the universe, it won't necessarily look like life on Earth. But we have one data point. We know that there is life on Earth. I see you right here. And that's a great starting place to recognize life elsewhere. I study how signs of life are preserved in rocks. And even if that life is gone now, how we could recognize those signs of life in rocks on Mars. Parts of Mars' surface is made of rusty minerals that formed in water. And the signs of life that I study form in similar iron-rich environments here on Earth, in California nonetheless. So if we think about our bacterium, we think about it being fossilized. It's covered in those iron minerals. That would preserve this bacterium's structure as a distinct filamentous biosignature. But just one of these, a million times smaller, would be really hard to see. Fortunately, bacteria are really sociable, and they like to live in communities with other bacteria. 
And when a lot of filamentous bacteria are living together and being coated in iron minerals, they can form larger structures that are detectable with high resolution cameras. Cameras like those on board Curiosity. So I asked Curiosity to take pictures of the rocks and I look for structures like these that can tell me there was once life on Mars. Now, the environment where Curiosity is now, where we drilled those holes, is an environment with normal levels of iron. And the signs of life that I study form in an environment with a lot of extra iron. Luckily, there are layers of rock in Gale Crater that contain an iron-rich mineral called hematite, which is similar to the rocks that I study on Earth. I want to send Curiosity to the foothills of Mount Sharp to these hematite-rich layers to look for those preserved biosignatures. They may or may not be there, but what we will learn about the history of Mars by traversing through Mount Sharp will revolutionize our understanding of our sister planet. It will make this trip worth it, I promise. Mount Sharp is a huge mountain of rock in the center of Gale Crater. It is five kilometers high and it's made of hundreds of layers of sediment. You can think of each of those layers like a page in the history book of Mars. And it turns out we have a lot of reading to do. Curiosity can't explore the whole thing. It's just too big. But we have found that our curiosity for Mars is boundless. Every mission that we've sent to Mars and every mission that we will send will continue to revolutionize our understanding of our sister planet. We will continue to explore Mars. I want to know if those little green bugs are hiding in the rocks. Finding native life on Mars would revolutionize our understanding of ourselves, our planet, and our place in the universe. Knowing that we are not alone in the universe would push us toward the final frontier and I think that would be an incredible feeling. Thank you.